Yeah. Just want to let you know in case you don't want to say anything you don't want the world to hear. Uh, record. Okay, let me mute this one over here. There we go. Now I can don't have to listen to myself talk. Okay. What's that guy saying anyway? Y'all, I had to make some changes. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Roger Paul, and I had to make some changes on Facebook today. And I want everybody that listens to our meetings to know that I went into the settings on Facebook. You know, everyone knows that I had to turn my take my phone number off because I was getting calls at three and four in the morning, five or six times a night. Well, people started posting stuff on my timeline, which was posting their pictures on my pictures for some reason. I don't know why, but it just, I started getting thousands of pictures from all the different people that listen to us. So I went into Facebook and under settings, I changed it that only I can post to my timeline. Now, I don't know how that affects the comments. You know, I always get, uh, uh, you know, thumbs up and comments and stuff. Last week I got Oh, over 200 and something uh, about the meeting last week. So I don't know if people will still be able to do that or not, but I changed it so that I only I can post to the timeline because I was getting people that were posting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures on my timeline. And I got a couple emails from people saying that they could not get to the meetings for all everybody's pictures that they were putting on my Ooh. timeline. So I tried to fix that. So let everybody know that's the case. And of course, during the meetings, I never answer chats. I don't ask answer chats anywhere. There's just too many of them. So just let everyone know if you try to chat with me during the meeting, I'm just going to close the window if I have the opportunity to do so. I don't want to be rude to anyone and everyone's important to me, but I just, it's impossible for me to re respond to everyone. There's just too many. I have 598, I think 90 something friends. I'm at the maximum on friends, so I can't have any more friends. So you're a you know. popular guy. <laughs> I get well, I hope it's the meetings. It's not me. I don't I never intend it to be me. Uh I'll be here and gone in the blinking of an eye. We all are, right? So what I uh, I'm not important. Only the meetings are important. What God has to say through the Urantia book, that's important, right? Everything else is secondary. Okay, let's uh, get started. And we're going to actually get through a couple paragraphs tonight, unlike last Tuesday, right? <laughs> I think we covered three or something like that. All right, so let's say a little prayer and we will get started. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share the Urantia book uh, with others. Uh, we thank Neil for our tip on that wonderful book we read this week. I finished that book. It was really good. Uh, and we thank all those that come and listen to us. And we hope that everyone benefits from this. So when they get to the mansion world, they won't be stuck in a remedial class for a million years. Let me put it that way. So we thank you. We give you the praise in your son, Michael, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Oh, okay. Roger. Yes, we will. Damn. We will get through. We will get through more than two paragraphs. I promise. <laughs> OK, well, in that okay. case, Tim, Tim, why don't you start reading to the, the first paragraph? Tonight? All right. Section five, right. the material sons, right. the great divisions of celestial life have their headquarters and Im immersed preserves on Jerusalem, including the various orders of divine sons, high spirits, super angels, angels and midway creatures, the central abode of this wonderful sector is the chief temple of the material sons. Okay, so um, on Jerusalem, they have headquarters for all these different orders of beings, okay? And when we get there, we'll be able to visit, uh, you know, the, these head headquarters uh, worlds and stuff. And uh, these headquarters worlds, they all have dwelling places for each type of the beings, and the, depending on what type of being is where the dwelling places are going to be, okay? And that's what they're talking about here. All right, let's go on to the next one. Let's see if this is going to work here. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong screen. Y'all bear with me one second. Let me find the right screen. Did it, 
it didn't advance, did it? All right, I'm trying to use the wrong mouse. I knew there's something wrong. Okay, here we go. Much All right, I'll, I'll take it because I'm next. We're going to leave, we're going to skip Diane this, this uh, time just to leave her rest. Okay. <laughs> okay, dear. Do I look like I need it? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm smarter than that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. The, the domain of the atoms is the center of attraction to all new arrivals on Jerusalem. It is an enormous area consisting of 1,000 centers, my God. Although each family of material sons and daughters lives on an estate of its own up to the time of the departure of its member members for service on the evolving evolutionary worlds of space or until their embark embarkation mm -hmm. uh, upon the paradise ascension career. Okay, so the domain of the atoms is where everybody wants to go see what's going on because of the Adam and Eve's, right? You know, each planet has their own Adam and Eve. Also, remember, we don't have to wait till we get all the way through all seven mansion worlds in order to take a trip to Jerusalem. Okay, we're allowed passes to go to Jerusalem early in in the man, early on in the mansion world career, and this helps build up our faith of the. The, the fact that we are going to make it to Jerusalem, we are going to go on the Ascension plan. So we'll, early in our career on the mansion worlds, we will get to go to Jerusalem, the system capital, and see all the wonderful things there. So it's supposed to be even more wonderful than the mansion worlds themselves. So it's probably going to be a little bit uh, overwhelming at first, right? All right. Uh, Rodney, would you take the next one, please? Uh, yes. These material sons are the highest type of sex reproducing beings to be found <coughs> on the training spheres of the evolving universes. And they are really material. Even the planetary atoms and these are plainly visible to the mortal races of the inhabited worlds. These material suns are the last and physical link in the chain of personalities extending from divinity and perfection above, above down and perfection above down to humanity and material existence below. These suns provide the inhabited worlds with a mutually contactable intermediary between the invisible planetary prints and the material creatures of the realms. Okay, so what they're talking about here <laughs> is they're talking that, telling us that the material sons and daughters, when they go out to a planet, they're totally visible to the inhabitants of the planet, okay? And that's important because they are the physical link between the inhabitants of a planet and the planetary princes and the midway creatures, because normally the planetary princes and the midway creatures do not make themselves visible to normal mortals okay so having a adam and eve that's physical that you can see all the time it gives us a link to those material those, to those midwares the caligasta 100 on other planets are called something else but the 100 volunteers that sent the planets to help you know bring us up to snuff so these Adam and Eve's makes it possible for us to see someone on our planet. Now, this is still true when we get to the mansion worlds and when we get to Jerusalem, okay? And the one fact of this is this, if you are lacking in a physical sexual relationship during your time on your planet, 
there's certain things you have to know or learn from that physical relationship. And if you miss out on that, you have to learn these things through the material sons and daughters by observation. Okay, so and there, people say, well, what are they, voyeur, voyeurs or something? And it's nothing like that. What they're talking about is in any sexual relationship, there's a spiritual, not only a physical, but a spiritual and, if you would, a mental relationship or thing that goes along with that sexual relationship. And those things are important for our growth and experience going through the universe. So that's the kind of things that we would observe with the material sons and daughters. Okay. So. Hey, Roger. If you, yes. Do well, you I mean, just just observation not participation observation not participation oh no. man <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to be viewing and oh great i see what yeah. your name sue's doing pretty good right now <laughs> yeah well you got to remember when you wake up on the mansion worlds what do you no longer have right a you, material. Don't have any, you don't have any sexual organs any longer right at all. yeah okay you have no you have no sexual organs and you have no anus because you don't need one anymore. Thank God. No residential okay. waste. No residential waste. That's right. Uh, there's no toilets on the mansion world. OK, so anything you consume, your body uses at 100 percent. Now, let me tell you a little secret. Because of that, you will not consume food like on the mansion worlds like you do on this world. And it was kind of funny as I read through that book that Neil gave us, all these people seem to do all the way through the seven mansion worlds is eat and dance and have a good time. You know? If you ate that much, you can't expand your body in the mansion worlds. You can't get fat like you can here. So when you're full, you have to use up that stored energy before you get stuck. Or you get what in your mouth okay so that that's an important book you have to what was that rodney oh um you got stuck for a minute oh okay well yeah yeah the point was you can't just keep eating indefinitely when you get to the mansion worlds because you can only eat as much as you will need to restore the energy in your body OK, so if you think you're going to get to the mansion worlds and just stuff your face all day, every day, that's not going to happen. OK, because your <laughs> new body will not expand in fat like this one will. I have uh, some questions. Go ahead, <laughs> Rodney. Um, Adam and Eve, like when they came to our planet. Right. Their bodies were not transported here. Right. Their bodies were made. Yes. And they put them into their body. Just like happens to us when we get to the mansion worlds, right? We're put so into the body. They had here, they, they ate material food. Just like we do, yeah. And they pooped. Just like we do, right. Okay, now, on on Jerusalem, do they have material bodies? Yes, they do. They have material well, bodies just like they're given here. So they eat normal food on Jerusalem. They have sexual organs mm -hmm. on Jerusalem. And they poop. Okay? They poop just like we do on this planet like on Jerusalem. They have to make facilities for them for that because they're material sons and daughters, right? Now, right. that does not change with them. When they get a new body, they go and do the same thing they've always done on Jerusalem, right? Okay? The difference is their bodies on Jerusalem are huge, just like they are when they come to the planet. Okay? We don't realize that. So if you go to Jerusalem right now, if you were transported there right now, all the Adams and Eves would probably be about eight foot tall. Dang. Okay. Just like they are when they come here. Now they the the surgeons of Avalon have to make account of that 
when they put them in the bodies that they come to to a planet. Now, let me give you a good example of this. When they go to a planet, like say, uh, all right, we know a lot about aliens and stuff like that. Let's say they went to a planet where everybody was a little short green man. Okay. Well, what would Adam and Eve look like there? Short green men. They would look like green men because they would use the DNA from that planet to give them bodies just like the little green men. Now, they may end up being taller like the greys are or something along that line because of the physicality of Adam and Eve, right? They would still need sexual organs and that sort of thing, okay? Because what do they do? They become the biological uplivers of the planet, okay? In order to do that, what do they have to do? They have to have children, okay? They wouldn't be able to do their job if they didn't have children, right? Make sense? That explains it. Yeah. You know, you see these cable channels where the people, they, they were eight feet tall and they find skeletons, mm -hmm. these people, and they have double row teeth and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Those were Adam's and Eve's children. They Some of them were. Some of them were, Gary, but many of them were the descendants of the Nodites which we know were the descendants of the Caligasa 100, okay? And they were eight feet tall. They were eight feet tall, yeah. All so, the, Calig the Caligasa 100s weren't little short guys like we are. They're all, they were all probably seven to eight foot, foot, foot tall to start out with. So when they rebelled and they went out to the land of Nod, they followed Nod, their leader, out to the land of Nod, they named, named the land after their leader, which was the rebel, rebellious Nod, okay, they become Nodites because they followed Nod out into rebellion. Well, those beings were huge to start out with, okay, so their early descendants started out, what, just like they were, huge, and as they married the local population, the men and women of the, or mated with the mo local population, the men and we, we, women, what happened? They got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter over time. Now, so, so, the, so the Egyptians, all these huge people you see in the, in the carvings in the pyramids and all this stuff, these were all just descendants of either Adam and Eve or the Nodites, one of the two. Make sense? It so, hey, Roger. Together when you have the information. Yeah, Tim. <laughs> You're basically saying our material sons and daughters, our Adam and Eve, have reproducing organs on a material sphere, such as the mansion worlds in Jerusalem. But in terms yes. of our status, we won't have those reproducing organs. Okay. That's right. We won't have Thank them you. anymore. Yeah. Okay. When you hit the first mansion world and you're given your first Marancha body, those Marancha bodies don't have reproducible sexual organs any longer. Okay? But it's also true, too, that if you have a material son and daughter that ascend towards paradise, they become more spirit, and those organs eventually it's pretty good. much fade. Yeah, when they start the ascension plan, they lose that. Okay, thank you. Now, another point that I want to make uh, that's very important about this is this. Who else does not have org sexual organs when they wake up? The children. The children. The children oh. in the father's nursery worlds. All those children that wake up on the father's nursery worlds no longer have reproductible organs like we do. Okay. So that's a disadvantage when a child dies early before the age of, of decision because they never get the opp that opportunity. So they have to learn all about sexual communication, sexual relationships, reproduction, all that from those who are teaching them, okay? <clears throat> but they never have the opportunity to do what? Have children, okay? That's just the disadvantage of the young dying, right? Okay. And they live normal lives other than that, you know, as normal as possible. They still have the same struggles as we do. And some of them do not survive.
you know, they choose not to survive. They have to choose to survive just like we do. It's required of every being. Okay, I love you too, even though you're a pest tonight. <laughs> Are you learning a lot? Huh? I want to be a perfect person too. Can I be a person too? I don't think so. I don't think it works that way. Okay. He knows the sec he knows the secrets of the universe, but he just cannot talk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Who's up next? Uh, Jane, I think you're up next. Oh, did I change the? Uh... No, I didn't change yet. Okay, give me a second. All right, now try it. At the last millennial registration on Salvington, <clears throat> there were of record in Nebedem. 161,432,840 material sons and daughters of citizenship status on the local system capitals. The number of material sons varies in different systems and their number is being constantly increased by natural reproduction. In the exercise of their reproductive functions, they are not guided wholly by the personal desires of the contacting personalities, but also by the higher governing bodies and advisory councils. Okay, so what would these governing bodies and advisory councils do? They would advise them on how many children they need to have, what their children's children would do, and that sort of thing. So they would keep the number of material sons and daughters on, at, under check all the time does that make sense so they're no, not just because they're going at it they're going at it pretty good at 161 million yes well <laughs> you're talking uh, about millions of years though gary you know so that's mm -hmm. not all that many you're talking to millions of years so that's not all that many right so they have to control how many children they have and even more, when they go to a planet, you know, they have to come up with a million children before they mix with the races. That's the plan. Ooh. Okay. So that's a lot of children, right? Poor Eve. Uh, yeah, poor Eve. You know, she'll be popping out a new baby every, every nine months at least. You know, even though they live hundreds of thousands of years, there's still a lot of kids, you know. So, and they say that Eve had no pains during childbirth. So that's a good thing too. <laughs> Why else would she want to go and do that? You know? yeah. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I understand that somebody said, or I got it from the book, I don't, I can't say where, but labor pains is directly due to the amount of purity within your strain, okay? Mm -hmm. And I was impressed one time because I was in the emergency room with kidney stones and um, made myself feel like a real big wimp because while I was waiting there, I was right next to a woman who was delivering a baby and she didn't make a sound. Mm -hmm. oh. And she was Mexican. What? I mean, she looked like she was pure Mexican. So I put well, some things to it. Yeah, they say that the violet race had no no uh, labor pains at all. The violet race. So if we would have gotten more of the violet strain mixed in with us, we probably had a lot less now, right? And pain is relative. Listen, I can tell you. The last four weeks, I've experienced more pain and, than mm. any other time in my life. Any other time Jeez. in my life, that's just constant. It won't go away. No matter what I, what pills I take or anything, it won't go away. You know, it's just all there's to it. So it's all in your tolerance for that sort of thing. You know, and you can get used to pain. You can get where you can almost tolerate anything, but mm. it, it's just not mm. fun. Not fun at all. So. Okay, so the, the thing I wanted to bring out in this paragraph, though, before we go on to the next one, is it said, it says here, they, are, they were not guided wholly by personal desires. You see that? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so it wasn't just their desire to mate and have kids that determined how how often they had children, that sort of thing. So wanted to bring that up. Okay, next one. Let's see. Uh, Diane, you're up. <laughs> We're all off kilter. Here. These the material sons, sons and daughters are the permanent inhabitants of Jerusalem and its associated worlds. They occupy... Vase, a vast, vast. I know. <laughs> they occupy vast estates on Jerusalem and part participate liberally in the local management of the cap capital sphere, administering practically all routine affairs with the assistance of the, the midwares and the ascenders. The assistance of the midwares and the ascenders. Okay, so they are literally the inhabitants of of the local systems. Okay, all that, you know, every system has its own Adam and Adams and Eves. Now, it's totally all right that the Adams and Eves don't ever go on the Paradise Ascension plan. Now, why would that be? That's because their local universe inhabitants. No, they were created to inhabit the local universe. So if they get the opportunity to go on the ascension plan, to them, this is a great honor, you know, to go on the ascension plan just like the humans do. Yeah, Rodney. Um, does the book say who the first Adam and Eve were? Or, um, yeah, guess what their name Guess what their name? Well, guess guess what their name were was Rodney. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> the very first. Um, the very first the Adam and Eve. System. Yeah. Where? Did, who created them? Michael did. Michael. Remember. Yes, remember the Adams and Eves are one of the few beings that were not created by the local universe, Mother Spirit, and Michael together. Ooh. All the material sons were created by Michael alone, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, right? Oh, you know, yeah, Gary. I am confused. A catch. When Adam and Eve defaulted on our planet, mm -hmm. okay, it was my understanding that um, they were kind of put into the ascension program. They were. They huh? were. Now, think about why, though, they were put in the ascension program. They were put in the ascension program because they defaulted on their original trust and this is very important they they defaulted from their trust they didn't rebel against michael they didn't rebel against the universe they defaulted on what they were do for do their they were to do for god the father that's a big difference okay so because they defaulted they were quote quote punished by becoming totally human. They lost all rights as a material son and daughter in Adam and Eve. So literally, they do not have the right to call themselves a part of the Adam and Eve assembly. You see what I'm saying? So they because became they, ascension people like us. They become ascension people. They became human. Now, when they became human, Gary, they lost the right for what? Eternal life. Adam and Eve oh, already have. Adam. Yeah, or Adam and Eve, when they come to the planet, they already have eternal life because they're material sons and daughters of the local universe. They will go on forever. Okay. Yeah. But but when they <laughs> defaulted, that right was taken away. So if they had not attached themselves to the thought adjuster, which was given to them, if they had not attached themselves to that thought adjuster and made the decision of survival, just like we do, then they would have died and disappeared just like <coughs> everyone else. They don't decide to follow God. 
Okay, this paragraph says that it is a reward to be uh, admitted to the Ascension plan. Yes. Did I, did I misunderstand that? That's true. No, you didn't misunderstand that at all, Gary, because the only way you can get part of the Ascension plan is do what? Make the decision that you will follow God the Father and you will survive and wake up on the mansion worlds. So if, let me give you an example. If Adam and Eve had got together after they defaulted and said, listen, we really messed up, you know, uh, we might as well follow all the rest of the people in the rebellion, which could have happened very easily, right? If they would have done that, then they would have been put in line for adjudication when they died. They would not have eternal life anymore unless they were adjudicated, okay? They had to make the decision right after the default that they wanted to follow God. They chose to follow God the Father, so they were given thought adjusters. And so they, like us, had to become faith sons of God at that point. They weren't they weren't material sons and daughters any longer, in other, in other mm -hmm. words. They were yeah, human. I understand that. Yeah. So they had to become faith sons of God, just like we are. And they have the faith that when they died, mm -hmm. they would wake up on the mansion world and continue on just like we did. That's exactly what happened. Okay. <clears throat> if, they hey, had not no. if they had not decided that, what would have happened to them? They would have been adjudicated on at death, and if they did not have anything salvageable, they would have ended just like everyone else that doesn't decide to follow God. <laughs> Make sense? Hey, Roger. Yeah. Which leads me to the question, why is the Urantia book in the Bible, but the Bible is not in the Urantia book? They're using categories like Adam and Eve, Melchizedek's. Mm -hmm. why do they do that so it's like saying why is the urantia book in the bible but in the bible the urantia book is not in the bible it's totally different because the urantia book didn't come along until 1934 1935 well actually it really started in, in 1912 to 1914 they well really i mean like why the does the urantia book use so there, there was no there, there, there was no reference and there was no reference when the Bible was written anything about this future revelation, the fifth epical revelation, the Urantia book. They didn't know about it, right? Make sense? All the books of the Bible were all written hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of years anyway, before the Urantia book even got thought about being coming along. And it wasn't till after the the crucifixion of Christ that even the midwayers didn't even conceive of retelling the story of Christ until after his death. And that was around 1300 uh, AD. Okay, so it was 1300 years after the death of Christ, the midwayers petitioned Michael to retell his story because so much is left out in the New Testament and some of it is just uh, skewed the wrong direction period okay so the midwayers really are the ones that wanted to start this so when they put the request into michael michael requested to the ancients of days that this be allowed and so it was michael's decision that they reveal the the life of christ now in the process the remainder we're studying now was part of the okay given by the ancients of days in the super universe and the most highs of the constellation. Okay. So when it went from just the story of Christ to the Urantia book, it had to have the approval of the ancients of days also and the most highs of our local constellation. Both of them had to approve it. Make sense? Basically, what I was asking is when you have somebody approach you and say, look, the Bible was written before the Urantia book. Why are you taking Adam and Eve, Melchizedek, these biblical names mm -hmm. and just creating your own revelation? 
You, you got that they, from us. You got that from the Bible. Why are you using their name? Because, because those people were actual people. And what's in the Urantia book is the truth about those people. Exactly. Not, exactly. not, not the myths that were put together mm -hmm. after the fact by people who wanted to keep the concepts alive. Exactly. Okay. So it's a it's it's a history in terms of our true history, not just in something that right. came thousands of years that was right. allegorically because you right. know primitive man had a creation story. We all they all no. had a creation story. But right, that, think, that would be my answer. If you think about it, the first three parts of the Urantia book are true revelation. Okay, because they're revealing what's happened in our history all the way back to the beginning of time. Okay. The other fourth part is a true revelation in the fact that it retells Christ's story the way it really happened. Correct. The fourth okay. epical revelation. The fourth epical revelation. Well, it's the fifth epical revelation. The fourth epical revelation was the story of Christ itself, right? Well, you mentioned Michael, Christ. yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. yeah. Right. Okay. So that is going on. Um I don't think, did we read this one yet, dear? Yeah. Yes? Yes, I just read it. Yes, okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here, notice here, here it says they're, they, um, they help administer everything along with the assistance of the midwayers. And who, who does the same thing on this planet? We do, right? We, they administer this planet with the assistance of the current midwayers we have on this planet. All right. Okay, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I think we're back to. Uh, no, you Gary. read after. Did you read after? It's Gary's turn. It's Gary's turn. Okay, Gary, would you read this one? I'll do that. By Jerusalem, these reproducing sons are permitted to experiment with the ideas, ideals of self government after the manner of the Chesedeks, and they are achieving a very high type of society. The higher orders of sonship reserves the veto functions of the realm, but in nearly every respect, the Jerusalem Adamite, Adam, Adamites govern themselves by universal suffrage and representative government. Sometimes they hope to be granted virtually complete and anonymity, autonomy, all by themselves. Yeah, uh, autonomy. Yeah, they want. They will eventually achieve the, to the uh, get uh, get to a point where they're allowed to govern on their own accord. Now, why would this be? That's because they're the permanent citizens of Jerusalem. Okay. So they have a say in how the planet needs to be run, really. And they get that information from the Melchizedeks who came before them, right? And the Melchizedeks had, all, Melchizedeks had already developed a perfect system of self-governance and management, all right? Hey, Roger, I don't understand yeah. where they say the veto functions. What does veto mean? In other words, uh, it, it, if they make decisions that the Melchizedeks do not agree with as a good governing policy, then the Melchizedeks have right, to step in and say, I don't think so. That shouldn't work that way. Okay. So okay, they just kind of keep them in check to make sure that it's, everything is run properly. Okay. Rodney, would you take the next thing, please? Um. The character of the service of the material sons is largely determined by their ages. While they are not eligible for admission to the Melchizedek University of Salvington, being material and ordinarily limited to certain planet, <clears throat> planets, nevertheless, the Melchizedeks maintain strong faculties of teachers on the headquarters of each system for the instruction of the younger generations of material sons. The educational 
and spiritual training systems provide for the development of the younger material sons and daughters are the acme of perfection in scope, technique, and practicability. Okay, so these younger material sons and daughters have the same opportunity that we have when we get to the mansion world to learn from the Melchizedeks and the universities of the Melchizedeks to, uh, of perfect management of planets, systems, and things like that. So they prepare them for their future, just like they're preparing us for our future as we go on through the universe. So, and chances are more than not that as we go through some of these Melchizedek University, we will have material sons and daughters, children in our classes with us, right? And of course, they'll be curious of where we come from and the planets we came from because they will, they, you know, curiosity, you know, uh, is in everyone. So they'll want to hear our stories about our planets and that sort of thing and how what we came through, right? And... Uh, I hope we don't get to the point where you, you all we can answer is like, can you spell stupid? <laughs> <laughs> hope it's not that bad. Anyway. Okay. On to the next one. Uh, Jane, would you tell take, take the next one, please? Six, Adamic training of ascenders. The material sons and daughters together with their children present an engaging spectacle which never fails to arouse the curiosity and intrigue the attention of all ascending mortals. They are so similar to your own material sex races that you both find much of common interest to engage your thoughts and occupy your seasons of fraternal contact. So it sounds like it's gonna be a nice experience to, to get to know the children of the Adams and Eves, right? And that's, uh, that'll be, that'll make a nice thing. We got a lot of good things to look forward to. Okay, now I'm messed up again. Is it, uh, it is uh, Tim again? I think. Tim, I think you're up again. Mortar survivors spend much of their leisure on the system capital, observing and studying the life habits and conduct of these superior semi-physical sex creatures. For these citizens of Jerusalem are the immediate sponsors and mentors of the mortar survivors from the time they attain citizenship on the headquarters world until they take leave for Edentia. Okay, so the Edentia is the, uh, is the constellation headquarters. Okay, so all the way up to the point where we're ready to leave and we've been trained, they're gonna help us out, right? And we're gonna interact with them. All right. I wonder why I call them a semi-physical. Because they're like superhumans, uh, Rodney. They're not only physical like we are, but they're encircuted. So that encircuredness right. makes them like superhumans. I understand. Okay. That's why also <clears throat> remember the Catalogasta 100 before they rebelled, uh, the local natives considered them supermen because they had all these aspects in their life which didn't affect them like they did ours. Right? They consider them gods. They consider them gods. And that's where all the myths, yeah, all the myths came from, right? Uh, uh, everything. All right, dear, you get a little short one. Yeah. Roger? Yes. Would that be a physical, like yeah. one higher than Morantia bodies? No, you know. they'll be lower than Marancha bodies, Jane, but they'll be higher than your normal mortal body. Okay, because okay. remember, the only thing that's between Marancha and physical is what? Uh, Mid midwayers, right? Midwayers, uh -huh. they're kind of in between. But they consider the Adams and Eves as physical, just like we are physical. The only difference is they have higher capabilities, right? That, you know, what all they could do, you know, they're probably super strong. They would be like a super man on this planet, is what they'd be, you know. But, if, but if they, they can had survive on your versa. 
Yeah, they can survive. They can survive. That's why Adams and Eves, as long as they have the sustenance of the tree of life, can survive hundreds of thousands, all the way into light and life, hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so they regenerate the, the, the since they're circuited, the, the tree of life regenerates their, their material makeup of their body so they never degenerate. They don't get old like we do. Okay, so, you know, you've heard me say over and over again, getting old's not for sissies. Well, they didn't have to worry about that because they didn't get old, right, uh, mm -hmm. with the tree of life. So, you know, because as we get older, what happens? Everything falls apart, right? We start to degenerate over time. And I don't care how well you take care of yourself, your body is going to give out sooner or later, right? Gravity takes over. Gravity takes over. You know, the, the cells just can't regenerate after time. And uh, so something takes you out. You know, you got to die of something unless you fuse and then you don't have to worry about that. Right. If you can get to the point where your mind is God's mind and God's mind is your mind and you are ready to fuse with that adjuster, you don't have to die. Right. You'll be taken up at that point. I've been working on that for years. I'm still here, though. You notice. So <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. Yes, Let's go is. on. <laughs> Diane. Yes, definitely. On the seven mansion worlds, ascending mortals are afforded ample opportunities for compensating any and all experiential deprivations suffered on their world of origin, whether due to inheritance, environment, or unfortunate premature termination of the career in the flesh. This is in every sense true, except in the mortal sex life and its attendant adjustments. Thousands of the mortals reach the mansion world without having benefited, particularly with the disciplines derived from fairly average sex relations on their native spheres. The mansion world experience can provide little opportunity for compensating these very personal deprivations. Sex experience in a physical sense is passed for these ascenders, but in close association with material sons and daughters, both individually and as members of their families, these sex-deficient mortals are, are enabled to compensate the social, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual aspects of their uh, deficiency. Thus are all those humans whom circumstances or bad judgment deprived of the benefits of advantageous sex association on the evolutionary world. Here on the system capitals afforded full opportunity to acquire these essential mortal experiences in close and loving association with the supernal Adamic sex creatures of permanent residence on the system capitals. Okay, how do I approach this? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of information. It's gonna be a fun one, isn't it? You can what do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably get hate. <laughs> I'll get hate mail from this one for sure. No, no. <laughs> let me put it this way according to what's in the book our over moralization of the act of recreation has created problems on this planet okay as human beings we have this innate desire to reproduce just like the animals do okay but have you ever seen a church for animals to get married? I have not yet. Done. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> never seen one of you, dear. Nope. nope, never seen one. Okay. So the difference is, is this we have <clears throat> men of good intentions come along and tell tell young people that they can't mate, they can't have children. They can't do this. They can't do that because they're not married or because they're not part of this part of the church or their elders don't believe in this. Let me tell you a little story you just won't believe. When I was uh, stud still studying Baptist stuff, uh, I was dating this girl that I was real serious about at one time. Mm -hmm. 
but she went off for a weekend to go to, to check out a college. When she came back, she had decided she was going to marry a total stranger. Wow. Okay. And you know why? Because some minister came to her and said, you're supposed to marry this such and such that she didn't know, had no idea who he was or what he was about or anything like that. But she trusted this minister. So she got married. That's okay. weird. Hey, Boy, I bet like that Kevin. left you heartbroken. Mm. Well, it did at the time, but I got over Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this sort of thing, when human beings put their two cents in something, is not always right. Okay, that's what I'm telling you. So this is what they're talking about. Because of uh, experien experiential deprivations. You see that? This is an experiential deprivation because of mm. supposedly holy men and women giving their opinion and putting their attitudes on the young people of their day, okay? So what we consider sin in reality may not be sin at all, right? That's okay. right. What the universe considers sin is totally different than what human beings consider sin. And this is part of what we're talking about. So what happens is so many young people, because of being controlled and put down and all sorts of stuff, will go all the way through their young adult life, never mating with another human being because they thought it was what? Quote, quote, morally wrong. You follow me? Everybody with me still? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. In reality, it had nothing to do with morals. It had more to do with the urge to reproduce, right? And if Adam and Eve would have survived, we would have learned all this from Adam and Eve. Okay. That's the whole point. So because of these sort of things, we end up with thousands and thousands of young people and they turn into what? Older people. OK, many of them never marry. Many of them never mate. Many of them don't ever have the opportunity to develop a personal sexual relationship with another human being because they think it's wrong. You follow me? So am I saying you should go out and start mating with anybody and everybody? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. OK, what I'm saying is. Our moral compass is not 100% on the right scale. You follow me? Does that make sense? All right. Well, I can so, hear people that are bisexual say, well, that makes perfect sense because well, you know, society says. Well, that's a whole different story, and I'm not getting into that one. Correct. But, <clears throat> but I'll tell you what it does say. It does say that. Just because some minister or some person you believe in uh, tells you something does not automatically make it right. Okay, so perfect example. If you listen to every single 600 and something videos I have out there and you believe every single thing and I tell you, you're a fool. That makes sense. Okay. Because no matter how I try, I cannot make everything that I try to interpret in this book 100%. I can only give you my opinion. Okay. Some of it's going to be right on the money. Some of it I'm wrong about. I know that. You know, I'm a human being just like you are. But you have a voice of discernment within you. It's called a thought adjuster. And you have a spirit of truth and you have a Holy Spirit that can tell you personally what is right and what is wrong for you. Not for me, for you. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's what that's about. So that's why I'm very careful about how I approach this thing about sex uh, on the mansion worlds because their attitude and their opinion about it is not the attitude that we have on this planet. You know, okay. this verse also makes me think of a little Asian girl who was 18 and her parents were pretty much directing her life and telling her, this is the career you're going to indulge in. This is what you're going to do. And she didn't have any say so in it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's right. At 18, 18 years yeah. of age. Yeah. You're going to be a doctor, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Think she's going to make a good doctor? I doubt no. it. Right. <clears throat> okay. Let's go on. So you got my point on that, didn't you, everybody? You didn't hit that too awful bad, did I? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's go on. Uh, I think Gary's up again. Okay. Let's no skip over surviving Tim. mortal. Ready? Did Tim read? I don't know. I think I, think I just. Did yes, just I did. Read? Yes, did? I did. Okay. Read. Go yes. ahead, Gary. Then, then it's got to be me. Okay. Okay. No surviving mortal, Vidware, or Ser Seraphim may ascend to paradise, attain a father and be mustered into the core of the fi fi of the finality without having passed through the that sublime experience of achieving parental relationship to an evolving child of the world or some other experience and analogous and equivalent there too. The relationship of child and parent is fundamental to the essential concept of the universal father and his universal children, universe children. Therefore, does such an experience become indispensable to the experiential training of all ascenders? And that is why we all have to raise at least three children. I wonder if... Uh, Wait a minute, this is not right. This Actually, he said no, this is no not yes. right. <laughs> yeah, you read it wrong. It should hmm? say no surviving mortal midlayer. What? What's or not right here? What's that? Oh, I was just making a comment that when Gary read it, it he, he left out the word midwayer. Where? Just at the top, it says no surviving mortal, midwayer, or midwayer. seraphim. Oh, he said no I? surviving mortal or seraphim. I'm sorry. He left he left out the word midwayer. It's okay. Um, yeah. I'm so sorry. So even even the midwayers have to experience this. Oh, right? wow. I no. just figured something out. These people that don't have children on this earth have a yes. cakewalk on the next side. How because, do you figure that? Because when a a child is on the other side, he doesn't need diapers. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, but Gary, I guarantee you, down through life, probably every human being has ended up having to change some child's diapers. I have many times over the years, and I didn't have any children. You know. Well, the Adam and Eve children. So, yeah, you know. And the other thing is this. They don't mention this, but there's a lot of ways to be fathers and mothers, you know. Uh, I mean, look at it this way. We've raised over the last 10 years probably at least 100 cats, wouldn't you say? So we have been father, mother, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief for every one of these animals. So that's yep. got to be good for something, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not a human being, but you got to take care of them just like mm. they're babies all they are at children. the same time. They are pity children. So, and there's, it's not easy to scoop poop, you know, four or it's, five hours out of the day. You it's know, work it's doing just, those cat boxes, those litter boxes. It is. It's work. Yeah. Any way yeah. you look at it. And you still have to feed them like you do children and, you know, the whole nine yards. So who knows what you get credit for. But the fact is, in the book, it states that you have to have raised or the equivalent of at least three children to the age of decision. And the age of decision is around 16 years old. Okay. So just to let y'all know. And we're out of time at 659. So that's why I keep telling Gary he's got it in like Flint, right? <laughs> Gary's gonna we'll, slide right through that first. We'll have to get world. Gary a we'll have to get Gary a gerbil. <laughs> really? <laughs> Gary, I, you, I got news to you. I did pick up duty today in my backyard for two 70, 80 pound dogs. 
Yeah, just like it, right? <laughs> Gary, okay. you are now, now relieved from duty. Now, Gary, I, you I tell my wife that, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get on that first mansion world and you come sliding by me and go. <laughs> 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 yeah. It won't happen. I'll be going like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay y'all listen i love you guys let's say a little prayer and we'll quit for today we're uh seven o'clock exactly so um <laughs> how about uh hey, tim would you like to close us in a prayer i'd like to pass okay that's fine sweetie would you close okay. us in a prayer? dear heavenly father mother god we thank you so very much for this evening um, we've learned a lot. We've we've experienced other people's experiences simultaneously with reading. And we thank you for this opportunity to grow and to learn more about the mansion worlds and what we have to encounter once we cross over. We thank you for um, Roger's ability to coordinate this and to have the understanding and the depth of, depth of knowledge to uh, open our minds and to help us to understand in, in preparation for this wonderful experience that we will be going all be going through. Uh, we thank you so much for life and for each other. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together today. And it is in your name, Jesus Christ, Michael. Never done. We pray, we give thanks, and we are so incredibly grateful. Amen. Amen. And thank all y'all at home that come and see us every week. And uh, um, we stop the video and stop the recording. Mm -hmm.